last uh, speaker, Zvi Aviv, won several awards for his open innovation work with life science companies, including awards for agricultural and pharmaceutical companies. He gained his data analytics and project management skills from the Hospital of Sick Children and the PhD in Molecular Genetics at the University of Toronto. An MBA from Ryerson University with a focus on management of innovation and technology complements his skill with business intelligence, business strategy, and presentation experience. So today he will talk about, he will talk to us about loss prediction in crop insurance. So let's welcome Tsvi. Thank you, thank you Dragos for inviting me and uh, thank you for staying and listening to a story that I think is more exciting than finding gold is actually uh, looking at food and food supply. Uh, you can't eat gold but you can definitely eat corn and we'll talk quite a bit about corn. My background is in medical genetics. I, I worked in structural biology, I worked in uh, drug development for a while. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, always with actually data science and bioinformatics because before it was uh, turned into AI and machine learning. And uh, I'll tell you today the story of, of uh, the companies that I started, uh, which recently we branded as Dagantech. And together with my co-founders, uh, Dean Lurie and, and Evgeny, uh, the company is, is young, we incorporated uh, in 2018, also coming out of a success story in a data competition that I'll tell you about. We raised a little bit of, of pre-seed funding, uh, hired and trained a small team of uh, intern and co-ops from uh, Waterloo mainly, and uh, we have one pilot project that we are now uh, working on, and I'll tell you more about that. Again, for, from, from the timeline perspective, so uh, we started with uh, relatively simple models looking at uh, not a lot of farms and now uh, graduating more and more into a more sophisticated model and generating more data and, and looking at many, many more farms with the idea of eventually going and, and measuring productivity on essentially every farm uh, on Earth. And, and we think it's, it's, uh, we can scale to this uh, point is just a matter of time. We got uh, some seed funding from Next Canada and BioEnterprise, and I just want to acknowledge the, the, their contribution to the story. We won't touch on the genetics side of things, but obviously when we're talking about yields and, and crops, it's all about the, the phenotypes that we are trying to predict, and phenotypes is coming together from the interaction between the genes and the environment. There is actually a lot of interest in the machine learning community in terms of looking into the genes and, and trying to uh, predict the phenotype from, from the genes. Currently, our models are not even looking at the gene side of things, but it's important to keep, keep in mind that the phenotype is not coming out of there. It's coming from the genetic makeups of these crops. Uh, we're mostly actually looking at the environment and, and looking at the, uh, using remote sensing to look at the environment and through that to get predictions of the phenotype, which is essentially is the fit between the organism and the environment. In 2017, I looked into, um, uh, into a competition. So I, I did several projects with Syngenta, and, and they were all successful, and, and they had nothing to do with, with data. They were more around the, the biology and the biology of crops and, and trying to uh, get an interesting insight uh, from the research and trying to translate it into commercialization in, in Syngenta. Uh, I never worked in Syngenta, but I was able to, uh, to get some of Syngenta's data uh, through partnership and through uh, open innovation. And, and in this case, it was a competition where Syngenta opened some of their uh, data sets, and, and they have a very large data set, both on the genetic side and on the, on the phenotype and, uh, uh, side of things. And the idea uh, was, okay, let's use, uh, we have all of this data, let's try to find data scientists and see what kind of insights that they can reveal to us. Uh, kind of similar to uh, the story before with geologists. Okay, geologists are working in one way. Can data science enhance the, the work of geologists? This is kind of similar story. We have all of these agronomists, we have researchers. Uh, they, they're using traditional uh, methods, research methods, experimental methods. But uh, with data science, there is always the potential that we can make their work uh, faster and more productive. Uh, 
and that's exactly what, what we found. So using the data that was supplied to us, but also um, looking at remote sensing as a way to get even more data than, than the data that was supplied by Syngenta. Uh, and that's kind of a no-brainer uh, today uh, where satellites are, are, are there, there is publicly available data. And again, it all depends on the resolution. The, the higher the resolution, uh, it's harder to get, but still the data is out there. It's just a matter of collecting it, cleaning it, and then uh, putting it to use. And in this case, uh, we, we generated time series from this data uh, and then use the uh, um, tr decision trees and other methods uh, to make, to do feature engineering and then to look at, uh, at predictions of yields out of this data set. And uh, we received uh, an award from Syngenta and we went to speak in a data science conference. Uh, and it, and actually, the, one of the interesting things is that the room was very, very small. So everybody else went to hear the presentations about uh, marketing, using data in marketing, using data uh, in financial analysis. Nobody wanted to hear about uh, using data science to predict uh, a corn yields. Uh, there is more people in the room now than the, the, than the conference that was in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So, uh, maybe maybe uh, right now there is more uh, willingness uh, uh, to hear about uh, using data science to predict uh, grain cork, cr uh, cork cr uh, they, to predict grains and the the implication is not only uh, in the food in the food system and sustainability because uh, we're sitting now in in uh, RBC and I don't know how many people knew that uh, how much money is being lent to farmers so that's part Part of the, the equation is the financial uh, industry that supports farmers. Uh, I was I was a, a bit surprised uh, when I looked into the numbers, and there are about hundred billion dollars uh, lended to farmers in Canada. Half of it is by government, and half of it is by the uh, private uh, banks. And uh, the, and so when we when we looked at this data in, in the early days, we we wanted we th we thought naively that. Uh, uh, the banks will be more than interested in looking at the productivity of the farms as a way to uh, make predictions on the financial risk of, uh, of the farmer. The banks uh, are not that interested maybe because uh, they have access to the, the bank accounts of the farmers so they can use financial tools that they are more uh, familiar with and they don't really have the, um, the passion and, and the ability to take a look at things that are uh, not in their comfort zone to look at uh, what the farmer was growing, how much he was growing. Uh, they said, okay, we'll leave it, we'll leave it to somebody else to, to tackle that. Who, who really cares about it in the financial system are the insurance companies that are insuring farmers. And again, it's something that is me, maybe uh, be surprising for people that are not familiar with the, uh, the way agribusiness is working right now, but no, no farmer in North America will plant anything unless He's taking an insurance policy uh, to protect his, his, his crops. And uh, this generates a multi-billion dollar global industry uh, where United States is a market leader with about $10 billion in premium a year. Canada is actually a, a big agricultural producer and also a player in the insurance, in the crop insurance market. The diff one of the main differences between Canada and the United States is that ca at Canada it's a, it's a monopoly by the government, so the government is, is providing uh, this insurance to the farmer through a crown corporation. Not, not that working with them is, is bad, if we can get to work with them we will be very happy. Just the, the, the drive to, uh, to innovation and to uh, uh, create more efficiency is a bit lacking what we find in Canada. In the United States, it's a, a different, slightly a different story. In the United States, uh, the government is, is subsidizing it. Again, part of the, the initiative here is to encourage farmers to grow because we in the city, we all eat the food that the farmer is growing. So the government are really uh, um, um, going out of their way, not only, not only for the political power of farmers, but also to support uh, farmers to enable them to, to go out to the field and, and uh, grow corn or soybean or wheat, etc. But it, the way the, the Americans uh, decided to uh, um, create this industry is by actually uh, taking a private insurance company and letting them manage this. And again, like the, the, the thinking behind it is if you give it, uh, if you create competitions, there'll be more drive for efficiencies 
and, and to make the system uh, operate much better. And in this case, so the, the, uh, these are some numbers from uh, 2018. This company has collected uh, $10 billion in premium and paid to farmers about $7 billion in claims. And the, 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 uh, the difference between it, uh, after also taking uh, some of the fees that goes to the government and some of the fees that go to reinsurance company, they ended up with, with profits that these are the incentive for these companies to be in this, in this business. How risky, so the, the risk in the, in the inherent uncertainty in farming is translated uh, to, uh, uh, to, the lack, so to the volatility and profitability in insurance. And this is the graph that's showing a loss ratio. So that's how you measure in insurance, that's how you measure your, your pr uh, profitability and, and efficiency is by looking at how much money you had to pay in claim over how much money you gain in premiums. And the goal of an insurer is uh, to get this number to this ratio uh, lower as possible, ideally to, to zero. So this, uh, these are the, the loss ratios over many years in the United States. And what you can appreciate from this graph, first of all, that the average loss ratio is not nearly close to zero. It's a, about a half. So there is a lot of, of losses and a lot of claims. As again, as, as you can imagine, in agriculture, it's still we're at the mercy uh, of weather, and th that's what uh, it looks like when it comes to when you try to insure uh, crops, you have to pay a lot of, of claims. So that's one, one thing to keep in mind. And the other thing is that uh, occasionally you get years where the loss ratio goes above one, which means that you're basically losing, losing your pay. So you're, you're, you have to pay more claims uh, over what you earn in premiums. And the big uh, concern in the insurance industry is, is that with global warming and, and other events, you'll get more of these correlated losses and that kind of put um, a cloud over the entire profitability of the insurance industry. And that's something that uh, is definitely concerning for the large insurers. What we came up with, is a, with a, as a solution for, for this is a set of tools that allow us um, to look at what farmer is growing, to make it's like in all of the prediction. When, when I say uh, predict, when I say prediction, we're talking about in-season prediction. So we don't even aim to predict the weather next year. That's something that's definitely uh, an ongoing challenge, and, and we are not the ones that are going to solve a long-term weather uh, forecast. We are limiting ourselves to make predictions. Uh, within the season and it could be uh, from the middle of the season to the end of the season. So uh, looking at the, the, the dynamics and the growth of the, of the cornfield and making the predictions of what will the farmer harvest at the end of the season, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the turf that we are uh, uh, trying to, uh, to enter and protect. And, it's, uh, and the, the secret, and again, I'm, going to, I'm not going to give all of the secrets, but it, it's a combination of uh, machine learning and uh, f the several types of machine learning algorithms, the, the several types of data, uh, putting it all together and uh, together with a, a good data set uh, to train on. And then we can come up with uh, some algorithms that I'll show you, or some results that I'll show you later. And why, why is this uh, is desired by uh, the crop insurance industry? This can help them uh, on four ways. It can help them assess past productivity. So when a new farmer is joining a program, they can take a look and see, is he uh, reporting the right uh, yields or is he making things up? It can, uh, in some cases, uh, we can predict risk before or as, as they are happening really and allow farmers uh, to mitigate this risk if, if it's the right, it depends on the type of risk. Uh, and there is a, a, a very big effort to automate the claim processes because that's where a lot of money uh, is going in cost uh, to send somebody to the farm to, to validate that the farmer actually uh, didn't harvest and is not going is not uh, using fraud uh, so there is a lot of there is all apparatus there are all mechanism to validate these claims and if we can do it with the remote sensing and machine learning the companies can save a lot of money in in the early days we didn't have access to the 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 right type of data and we needed to prove to prove that all of these ideas are, are, are feasible, that we can actually do something with uh, significant with remote sensing. Again, the, the idea seems, seems very uh, feasible that a corn is growing in the field, take a satellite images, see what is there. It's 
it's, an, it's a no-brainer. Uh, unlike, let's say, in geology where, where the deposits are really under the Earth, uh, kilometer under the Earth, the satellite images have no chance to penetrate. The, the, the nice thing about corn and soy is they all, uh, you, can, you, can be, you can see them uh, quite easily with satellite images. So we uh, demonstrated this with a, a relatively simple model that, in, that looked at the county level uh, production. And again, the, the, the United States and also Canada uh, are releasing every year for the last uh, 20 years or more data of how much corn uh, was, pro or how much soy and how much wheat was produced in any uh, county. And so this is aggregated at the county level and it's very clean, very nice data to work with. Satellite data, again, getting low resolution satellite data is not, is not that hard. And the rest is just bu building, creating the pipelines and creating the, the machine learning algorithm. And in this case, uh, we use a convolution and we all, uh, on the images uh, straight and also uh, derived some information out of the, the images and then ran uh, as a time series and then ran LSTM models and, on them. So what we learned from this exercise was that we, we can do it, we can generate predictions, the predictions are, are okay. So here you can see the distribution uh, of the prediction uh, and relative to the ground truth, uh, where well, the ground truth is in blue and the predictions are in gold. So they're more or less overlap, they're not perfectly overlapping. We also, uh, when we mapped uh, the predictions and the accuracy of the prediction, when, when you can see on the map on, uh, on the uh, left side, what you can see is that not all the counties are equal. So, the, so our models tend to be more uh, accurate in the corn belt, if you're familiar with, with where corn is grown in the United States, so in the Illinois, uh, Indiana, um, Iowa areas. This is where our, uh, the, this, uh, these are the areas where most of the corn is grown in the United States, and, and that's where our models tend to be more accurate. In the periphery, our models suffer uh, from uh, um, and some uh, uh, errors that we're still uh, looking at the cause of them. Is it because of a different uh, agricultural practice in this area, different weather patterns? Uh, there definitely, uh, uh, it's an area of interest. Why is there are geospatial uh, differences uh, when it comes to these models? But th this is only the entry point because really the, the insurers are less interested in what we can do in the county level. They are very, very interested if we can make the prediction on the farm level. What, how, how much uh, a farmer John will harvest and how much uh, its neighbor will farmer. That, that's really what they want us to do. And we're, we're getting there. Uh, again, it, it's, it's been uh, a, a, a slower than what I expected, but still we're definitely making uh, 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 progress in, in the sense of uh, getting there. So w here what I'm, I'm showing uh, are in red are the prediction, the errors of the predictions of the, the model uh, that we were working was in, were in, in April. Uh, and as you, ca you can appreciate, there are definitely uh, much more errors uh, than the uh, models that we are uh, working right now in, in uh, November. We um, in ingested more data and uh, uh, working now with, with more uh, decision tree models uh, and we're getting a tighter uh, a prediction. So our, our errors are reduced. And, and again, we, with more development and more uh, ensembling of models and, and ingesting more data, we, we expect to get this even more narrow so we can get, um, we, we estimate that we'll be able to get 95% accuracy in the predictions of our models uh, before we, we can go to market with a product that uh, is big, that can be utilized by the companies. And, and the idea again, so it's, it's a relatively uh, limited uh, field. There are, not, uh, there are not as many insurance companies that are insuring uh, farmers as there are companies that insure our cars or, or our houses. Uh, but they are, uh, this co these companies are the ones that we, we are, ex we are working with one of them and we are expecting uh, to work with as many of them as possible in eventually making uh, the predictions as a service. Uh, again, looking at about 300,000 uh, farms in the United States and expanding this uh, to other areas including Canada, South America, etc. What was happening, what is happening in Canada is also interesting because uh, looking at, again, like trying to, to, to look at what will happen in the future in Canada, uh, we spend some time looking at the, at the climate models. Canada is behaving differently than the United States. 
So actually Canada is experiencing more rain uh, as, as a result of global warming as opposed to a more, more risk of drought in the United States. So it's definitely one of the things that we need uh, to consider is what, kind, what type of models really we want to generate for the a crop insurance client? Are we uh, going to uh, make a bet that uh, we, we need models that will really uh, look at the result of a drought? And that's probably the, the case for Kansas and Southern United States. Or, or do we actually need to invest our, our time and energy in models that predict uh, uh, floods in, the, in Canada, for example, in, in uh, Manitoba? Or maybe we need to look at, uh, at pests because, again, the, the expectation is that with, with more rain and more humidity, we'll have more uh, pressure from uh, diseases like fungus. Uh, so we did kind of uh, um, created a small uh, scope, a potential for a small project to look at the disease, a corn disease, Fosarium, that actually uh, created millions and millions in, in uh, damage for farmers in Ontario in 2018. And uh, we thought that the, the insurer company in uh, AgriCorp, the, the uh, insurance company in Ontario will be interested in it. We're still waiting to hear. Uh, I, my, my gut feeling is that it will take us years to convince them that, uh, that we have something. And then we'll have to go a lot through a lot of red tape in terms of ac accessing data. Uh, individual data, who owns the data, the farmer owns the data, or the insurance company owns the data. Again, th these are fascinating ethical, ethical questions, but we can't uh, uh, um, bet our, our lives that uh, uh, our road to market will be easy in Canada. In the United States, the, the entire um, thinking around privacy is, is such that uh, there, are mo there are less barriers in terms of accessing farm uh, data. That's something that again, in a, whenever you're dealing with an AI uh, product, you have to look at the data. And whenever you have data, you have to start uh, asking yourself the questions of how do I get this data? Uh, do I, can I rely on this data? And uh, uh, what are kind of the, the limitations around this data? And again, we, we we're also uh, trying to expand our horizon behind North America and trying to see where, where this type of models uh, will be useful. And one of the areas that is now actually an emerging area in terms of insurance is is India where uh, about $5 billion of premiums in crop insurance are collected. And India is a major, major uh, producer when it comes to, to rice and wheat as, as well. And we uh, had the opportunity to, to create some conversation with the government of India. There is definitely an interest, but again, like the, uh, there are also a lot of barriers when it comes to uh, uh, getting a very clean uh, agricultural data in India that we can uh, build a model upon a solid a foundation of good data. Uh, that's again like something that we're, uh, this is fascinating to follow and uh, hopefully we can play some role there, but it's still uh, early days uh, in this sense. And again, like, uh, we are obviously not the only, the only uh, companies that is looking into this. Uh, it's uh, an emerging uh, si um, business right now. There are companies that are more established and, and more uh, capitalized than us, including the Card Lab, S4, Agrograph, uh, that are working directly with insurance companies and reinsurance company to look at this type of uh, uh, models. And there are also companies uh, like Farmers Edge or Farmers Business Network I, I, um, that, are war that are even larger companies and already uh, utilizing some of these models, again, in a slightly different context. So Farmers Edge, for example, are using models to look at fertilization and, and help farmers improve uh, fertilization. And they're eyeing uh, the other opportunities uh, when it comes to uh, using data. Uh, so it's definitely, it's, if it's something that is in your passion to use AI models um, in, the, in the ag tech world, there are definitely opportunities for you out there. And to, to provide even wider uh, context, so this plot shows the, over, the corn yields uh, in the United States. Uh, and you can appreciate how uh, our productivity is improving dramatically from uh, in the last 50 years. We're just uh, 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 growing like more and more corn per the same uh, amount of land. Despite the fluctuations that are coming from the, the impact of the weather, there is definitely a much more productivity. And this is the result of, of not one single 
a factor. It's, it's the, the mechanization, so more tractors, better tractors, stronger tractors, a better fertilization, so a lot of innovation in chemistry uh, in terms of fertilization and pesticides, and also in the genetics and the, the corn hybrids that are being produced are, are much, much, much better now. And with all of these uh, angles, there is opportunity for data and, comp and uh, AI and machine learning to keep, keep, to keep this improving. Again, we don't know if we are in the end, we reach the maximum uh, when it comes to uh, productivity in, in corn and soybean, or we're just in, the, in a, a phase where now with availability of more AI and more machine learning tools, we can actually get uh, productivity enhanced. And in my opinion, this is uh, one of the, the um, uh, necessary uh, events that we need, or innovations that we need to harness uh, to protect humanity in general uh, for the events like climate uh, warming and climate change because uh, we, if we can harness these tools, we can grow um, corn or soybeans that is either drought uh, tolerant uh, or pest tolerant and just get uh, away from uh, scenarios where we'll be exposed to uh, lack of uh, food or, or sustainability issues in the future. Uh, in the end, before I open the floor to question, I just want to uh, uh, do some crowdsourcing exercise. I, I'm playing with two potential logos uh, for the company. If you, if you like uh, logo A, can you raise your hand? Okay, and if you like logo B, can you raise your hand? Okay, so that's, I think, overwhelming <laughs> result. Okay, thank you very much. A any questions? You can choose two questions also. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I was an agri-analyst back in India, so it was very insightful to see this. Um, one very basic question. So when you use satellite imaginary, uh, how often do clouds trouble you? Yeah, no, cl clouds is a major, is a major problem uh, for us. Um, so, one like the, 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 the low, the easiest way to handle it is to just remove them, and we can rely on. So, so the data it comes from NASA, so we are not even doing the the primary processing. It comes with flags on flags. So the, the first thing we do is just remove the the clouds. And, and again, like one one thing that actually just again like expanding on your question. We're not uh, dealing like with one satellite images, right? So we, we have uh, satellite images uh, every, let's say every week or every two weeks, we have another and another and another and another. So it's slightly different than, the, let's say the, the geology or some other project where you just have like very high resolution, but one time we're talking about a series of uh, images. And in this case, the clouds, okay, so maybe, maybe a, this week you have clouds, but next week you'll get a, a clearer sky. So we're, we're trying to get like a more a video a kind of a, a, a multiple frames over time. And so that's kind of one way that we can deal with the clouds is just, tr just translating this into a time series and then we can smooth the time series. So that's one way to deal with it. Can I get a lady question? No? Okay. So can you choose? There is there? Oh, yeah, there oh, is. I'm sorry. Okay. Can't see that far. Sorry. Thank you. Um, have you looked at any, say, uh, gene transcription data, or is there any thought of looking into that to see if there's any predict predictability or anything like that? You know, I'm, yeah, I'm very, I'm very interested in the, in the genes. My, my, I, I'm coming from a world of, yeah, first let's look, look at the DNA, look at the RNA, let's see what is happening. Uh, and it, I ha so for right now it's not accessible for us. So we, we don't, we don't, uh, we barely even know what hybrid the farmer is growing, let alone what is the genetic makeup of what is, is what is growing. In, in the world of competition or what the data that is available to, for Syngenta, yes. Uh, so occasionally in this competition, they're, they're providing uh, data, genetic data. And in this, in this case, actually, in the competition I did, uh, they use SNP data, if you're familiar with. Uh, and uh, I did actually look at the opportunities to uh, explore this data. And one thing that I found uh, that 
won't be shocking if you're in genetics, yield, yield is a complex trait. So it's not that easy to go from a, a genetic data and try to predict yield because yield is a combination of many, 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 many genes. Uh, so I kind of demonstrated with their own data that it's not, it's not soluble right now with, with the current data. What we could do is, is identify in certain scenarios where, where there are very limited amount of genes, yeah, then, yeah, then yes, if this is the case, we can uh, see very strong patterns in SNP data that we can say uh, these genes are playing a role and therefore uh, these hybrids will be more expected to be uh, let's say uh, more d more d uh, drought tolerant or more uh, 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 resistant to a certain pesticide. So it, it, there is a room for for looking at the genes, but not uh, but not in the, in the yield itself, more at the other traits. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Oh, you have another one. Was, there was another yeah, question. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. Uh, coincidentally enough, the previous person asked quite a similar question. I wanted to know if there is any space for integration of bioinformatics in your work. Uh, but what came to my mind is uh, I can certainly imagine that uh, catching somehow genetic makeups uh, of the crops across the millions of hectares can be very difficult. But maybe uh, taking uh, genomes or, or some seg segments of genomes uh, from parasites, diseases, or uh, insects can be helpful so i wanted to ask whether this is something you can come up with or you, you think it can be integrated in your framework no i i'm personally very interested in it but right right now again like, as i said i don't have access to all of this genetic data but if if you have a specific ideas i'll be more than happy to to talk to you after yeah. now thank you again <laughs>